meeting of November, I'll get it, fourth meeting of the Elsa County Planning Board. Come to order, roll call, Dennis. Thank you. Ms. Pecora. Ms. Geary. Ms. Nance. Mr. Conyer. Here. Mr. McCarthy. Here. Mr. Proctor. Mr. Lanzetta. Oh, Ms. Miss Lanzetta. <laughs> Mr. Calamano. Here. Mr. Bodges. I'm here. Mr. Wilkin. Mr. Bodden. Here. Mr. Brown. Here. Ms. Ovardi. Here. Ms. Welton. Here. Mr. Watkins. Dennis, if I remember right, he had a conflict with his planning board tonight. Yep, I got a list as excused. Thank you. Um, Mr. Omquist. Here. Mr. Markowitz. Victor, I know you're here. Yeah, I'm mute. No, I got him. Okay. <clears throat> Mr. Rudikoff. Yeah, I'm mute, Mark, Matt. We got you, Matt. Ms. Weiner. Thank you. Here. Thank you. Mr. Murray, is she excused? The list is absent. Mr. Murray is excused. I thought so. I remember that. Mr. McLaughlin. Here. Mr. Bonavita Goldman. Mr. Gio Gagliari. I'm here. Ta uh, Mr. Wilkins is here too. I just. Mr. Wilkin? Here. Yeah. Okay. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. We have fifteen. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> I have a motion for approval of the minutes of the October meeting. So moved. Is there a second? Your second. Mike. It's Mike Baden. I, I did have one correction on the zoning referrals that I gave to Mary Ann to just to want to make sure that it got cor corrected. I think she, I think she told me it did. So you sent out an evening note where it was corrected. Yes. Okay, thank you. It came out late today. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Uh, uh, I, 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 opposed. I'll get back to that. No, nobody's opposed, right? Nope. Okay. <clears throat> okay. You have anything on um, education and training opportunities? I do not. Um, yeah, Mike, there, there's something that the, and I, uh, I should have looked it up sooner. The Planning Federation is doing something during the daytime. It's something about the courts and code enforcement. And uh, I, I will, I think I sent the link to Marianne and she may have circulated it. It's, it's Tuesday at 12 o'clock, I believe. Thank you, Drew. It looks like a really useful class and very different from the normal classes, so. Yes. Okay. Um, I haven't had a discussion with respect to the training that was done by um, Barton LeJudas. Um, I guess my question is, is that was well received. I will start a discussion with them and see if they have anything else that they would want to talk to us about. Um, but I have a, I have a couple of ideas for them as well. Um, just be aware of that. Um, the other thing that's out there is, is that the county's working on a housing action plan. 
I'd really like the board's help in, in terms of getting that out. And so what I'm thinking about doing is um, having a training session on the demographic, the current demographics of housing so that we can get a sense of what the problems are and what the, and what the potential solutions are. And trying to do that um, sometime, I would say, in the middle of December, I hope. I don't want to do it too soon, but, I, but I, I'm trying to, to fit one more in before the end of the year. Okay. All right, just uh, be aware of them. I think we're all in pretty good shape, but make sure your uh, alternates also up to date on it. Okay. Anything on community reports? It's all quiet in everybody's community. Wow. Actually, well, uh, I, I have a question that I, I, doesn't involve the town of Rochester. It's actually, but I've gotten a number of questions from residents in Wawarsing. Apparently, Department of Corrections is building a large solar site across directly across the street from where the Walmart is. Um, the question is, what kind of reviews do they have to go through? Uh, I know they're exempt from local planning board reviews, but do they have to follow Seeker and, and anything else? Because uh, it kind of looks like they're doing whatever they feel like there. Well, clearly they're subject to seeker, but they're not subject to local zoning. I got a call from the supervisor asking questions about it, and I've got a couple of calls about it as well. The real concern from from a lot of perspectives is is that they, you know, they shouldn't be covering valuable farmland, but that's beside the point. Yeah. Um, and the second piece of that is is that um, at a minimum they should make sure that the bottom edge of those uh, facilities are at least above the hundred year floodplain. Well, and it's, it's a bit of a bowl, so no matter how much screening they do, unless they go considerably high with it, there is none. I mean, you're looking down into those fields, and I just think back to all the time and, and effort that was spent on getting, like, the right rock for in front of Walmart, and now this is just springing up kind of out of nowhere. So, I mean... If somebody wants to, I mean, the, the town could write a letter to docs, the, the county planning board could write a letter to docs if that's what you want to do. I, I only bring it up because I was asked by a number of, of people, just as somebody who knows planning and zoning, what what docs has to, who docs has to answer to. And I, I more or less suspected that what you said is the case, that they're exempt from any local regulations. Uh, they still have to follow state building and fire code, but... The seeker question came up because, you know, clearly I don't remember seeing anything circulated under seeker on that. Yeah, unlisted action maybe. I, I'm I'm trying to think. There there are certain exemptions in the in the new, in yeah. the state law under under for for solar facilities that's now out there. But it's it certainly is poorly placed. Let's put it that way. But if it's um if it's uh, Department of Corrections. You know, they'd be their own lead agency under a secret correct. review. And yeah. they would, if they did an unlisted action and did not choose to circulate, if there's anybody to circulate to, there'd be no distribution. Yeah. Understood. I mean, you could request it to make sure they did it. Yeah. Okay. I just had, I've had a number of inquiries from people and I said I would get back to them. So thank you very much. Okay. Anything else on community reports? Well, Shandaken has three projects in the works, and we're lead agency on all three. Uh, there may be environmental review on two of them. Uh, one is an existing campground that is going to become a glamping facility with uh, 10 platforms. Each has their own individual bathroom, uh, and that's near but not in, the, uh, not in the flood zone, I believe, for the Asopus Creek. And right across from there is on the hill, the side of the mountain with 100 plus acres, uh, the former Maidstone Hotel will be renovated into a 36 room hotel with 15 cabins, uh, new, new built cabins. 
um, and some existing buildings that will become uh, <clears throat> rentals as well. Um, there's also a um, protected rattlesnake den on the property or near the property. So that there will be environmental review. Um, then the third uh, project is the former Copperhood Inn, uh, which will be uh, renovated and uh, have workspaces built on an island, actually surrounded by the Sophus Creek and a, a branch of it. So there is some issue with the flood map. They're contesting the actual flood lines and saying the elevations that they calculate mm -hmm. are not matching what's on the flood map. So there will be uh, asking for an amendment to the map. Um, and that's also uh, close to bald eagle <clears throat> habitat or including it. So it becomes a little complicated. Uh, part of this uh, third project is in the floodway. So we are concerned with um, how to deal with that. Um, so that's all three of them are in the process of uh, getting approved by various agencies. Um, Mr. Okay. Chairman, if I may. I just wanted to just say, uh, as long as that project came up, the se the second project that I mentioned in town of Shandaken, the, the Maidstone project, I'm the consultant on that project. Yes, right? I, I thought you were, right. Um, so you can speak to that. Um, well, now, I don't know if I can speak. I may, I may not be able to, I'll have to. Oh, oh I see. I, I, I understand, of course. Um, well, well, let's clear that up. What, what is the situation with that? Since he is the consultant to, um, he is the consultant to Shandaken. No, to the applicant. Oh, you're a consultant to the applicant. Correct. Okay, so Ellen is the consultant to Shandaken? Or... Who? Okay, you are working with Ellen Hart? No, I'm working with the, uh, oh yes, yes, but I'm with yes. the... The team with Luke and Tarante and Cyril okay. and Tarante. Okay. Mm -hmm. I know you were going to uh, clear something up about the slope underneath the hotel at the um, at branches. Mm -hmm. I think Ellen was asking you, uh, you to clarify that as to whether there's erosion on the slope. Can we really be discussing these projects yeah. before yeah. they're in front of us? Okay. No. Well, they're they're coming on as you're correct, Cynthia. It's, it's but it's coming on as, as a, a community report, and I'd like to have the report. I don't think we have to go into the detail we're in right now. Okay. Yeah. Yes. But if anybody has any feedback about some issues that we might want to um, address that we might not have thought of, that that would be the reason for me bringing it up. Well, I would suggest a gateway meeting would be would be maybe in order if if possible. You could okay. ask them if they would come in for a gateway meeting. Okay. That would maybe helpful. Right. I think the, the branches project did come in for a gateway meeting last year. Okay. Um, okay. Yes, it did came in for a gateway. Yes. Anything else on community reports? Yeah, Mike, this is Drew from Olive. I, I'm not very familiar with this project, but the planning board right now has got a uh, 14 lot subdivision that's gonna be on Lower Saddle Mill Road that will ultimately wind up at the county level. And the, the reason I bring it up right now is there's a, a fairly significant community uh, backlash to that particular subdivision. So I, I suspect when it comes to the board, there'll be a number of people showing up in opposition to it. Okay, something to look forward to. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Dennis, do you have, uh, did you get the uh, people that have arrived? Um, Lisa's here and Cindy's here. Yep. And I Lisa, I just wanted to say, I think you saw that um, they made a determination for the multifamily dwelling complex, um, local law for Hurley. But they have asked the developers for Cedar Development to come back before the planning board for them to make a secret determination. Thank you. Okay. Um, for the planning board reports, uh, I have um, put together a nominating committee, um, Tom Wilkins, Mike Biden, and uh, Mark Watkins to uh, come up with a slate of candidates for us to uh, vote on uh, at our December meeting. So they're hard at work. Uh, 
rounding that up. So um, if they do call you or touch base with you, um, give them a friendly friendly response. That's all I have on the um, regarding the planning board reports. Um, Dennis, planning department. Sure. Um, from a financial perspective, um, the legislature is still considering it. We're in good shape in terms of our existing budget. Um, we, um, you know, we still have some money left for professional studies that we're, we're currently doing with respect to the Transportation Council. Um, and we've saved a ton of money on travel, by the way. Um, so that money has gone back to, uh, we'll go back uh, to the general fund um, at the end of the year. The legislature is still contemplating the, uh, the um, 21, 2021 budget. Uh, so we don't know where we are for 2021 yet. Um, from, a, from the budget that was submitted by the county executive, uh, we, were, we were pretty much held harmless from our current budget uh, as, as reduced from the, from the, uh, the COVID-19 reduction of 10%. So we're, we're in good shape for next year, depending upon what happens relative to the, uh, what, what that, the legislature. There is money in that budget. Um, for reapportionment uh, based on uh, the 2020 um, census. So we do have some money in the budget for reapportionment uh, if it's needed. Uh, the legislature may put that money in their budget. Uh, we're not sure. Uh, we've had some preliminary conversations with the chair of the Ways and Means about that, um, but we'll have to wait and see. So from a financial perspective, we're in pretty good shape. Um, Environmental notice bulletins, we have a lot of lead agency um, discussions ongoing. Uh, lead agents, two lead agencies in the, in the request from the town of Lloyd. One is a, uh, uh, both of them are retirement communities. Uh, we also have a lead agency request for something that's on our agenda tonight. It's Homeland Towers in the town of, in the town of um, New Paltz. Um, and we also have Springland Farm in the town of Gardner. Uh, for a site plan review, uh, so those are those are the lead agency requests that are out there from uh, from that we've received with respect to communications. I have nothing to add with respect to the environmental notice bulletin. Are there any also questions? Got, we also got to address scoping on the Homeland Towers too today. Thank you. Uh, that's that's right, uh, Robert. Thank you. Um, and then on communications, I have really no no additional communications other than those. Um, other than those, um, sorry, other, th I'm trying to do too many things at once. Other than the um, lead agency request, we do have one other communication and that's from the uh, New York State Parks and Recreation Historic Preservation Officer. And that's for uh, the AME uh, nomination for the AME Zion Church in Kingston on 26 Franklin Street as being eligible for the National Register. Hmm. That's the only communications I have. So from a director staff reports, um, a couple of things I just want to say. One is to thank you to the board members and to Vivian Welton for our census efforts. We've got a lot of census signs out. We had a lot of effort. Vivian did the yeoman's work for us, actually stapling signs together and carrying stuff around and, and delivering uh, tension signs for us. Um, our effort was fairly successful. We increased, since we our, our efforts began, we increased the participation in the county by about one, by about 0.7%, about just around under 1% uh, in terms of that. We've reached probably in the neighborhood of 80,000 people uh, with that outreach effort. Um, and our partners are, uh, were uh, Cornell Cooperative Extension was a partner. Rupka was a partner. We had community foundations, which contracted with all the libraries for us. So most of the libraries in the county were partners uh, and also family of Woodstock, uh, People's Place and a few others to, in terms of trying and the NAACP in, in the Warsing Ellenville area were partners as well. So it was a good effort. Uh, most of the towns uh, exceeded their 2010 participation rates. I can send the board those, uh, the final rates uh, as of the 26th of October, um, in terms of participation, if the board is interested, um, so that's that's where we are on on that. 
Um, the housing report that we were talking about, the housing action plan continues to move ahead. Um, we would anticipate that we're in we did some public outreach now. Uh, we were somewhat, quite frankly, disappointed with the number of people that attended some of the public outreach sessions. So we're gonna go back and see if we can have a conversation with some of the, uh, the chambers. Uh, and as I just was discussing before, perhaps a training session for this board um, and local planning boards, just to give you a sense. So the local planning boards get a sense of how uh, dismal the housing picture is in Ulster County with respect to affordability. Um, and part of the reason to do that is to remind local planning boards that um, the responsibility for local planning boards goes beyond just sort of uh, reviewing projects um, or participation in comprehensive <laughs> plan work. Um, if, if there's, once you see some of these problems, the real question is, is the local planning board should be thinking about what they can do and what they can recommend with respect to solutions. Um, I would be significantly disappointed if the local planning board's position was that it's, you know, it's somehow it's an elected officials problem or a private sector problem and not a problem that should be part of a policy discussion of a local planning board in terms of housing. Um, and it's, it's compounded by the fact, and we just heard some of the discussion tonight, it's compounded by the fact that the backlash for, for with respect to growth is, is increasing, not, not decreasing, at the same time when the county needs to produce housing units. Um, and we really need to think about what we're going to do as a, as, as a local board. The county planning board is participating and, and the staff is participating in this. And we would anticipate coming back to you as staff in the future and asking for some strong policy uh, support from the county planning board in terms of upzoning and increased density and, uh, and inclusionary zoning in order to deal with these, these affordability questions. Because if we don't have a public policy response, we're literally going to lose a workforce. So that's out there. The other thing we're working on is the Ulster County Housing Development Corporation, which is a 501c3, which was formed by the county to essentially deal with uh, some of the county lands. We would anticipate that we will announce a preferred developer for the Golden Hill site tomorrow. Uh, we haven't voted yet. I'm a member of that corporation. We haven't voted yet, um, but we have, we would anticipate that out of the discussions that are likely to take place tomorrow, we'll come to a conclusion. Uh, with respect to with respect to uh, a preferred developer for that site. Uh, we continue to look at uh, the county's um, lands that we require in REM or, or for tax sales to see whether there's any opportunities for housing and or environmental issues associated with those lands. I would um, remind the board and, and remind municipal municipalities that if there is a, prior, a property within your community that is proposed to be auctioned off that the community can petition the county to pull that property and hold it for a municipal purpose. Um, you're going to have to promise to pay us our back taxes, but you can basically get the property pulled. Uh, Town of Gardner, I know, has a property adjacent to the, uh, the Palisades Interstate Park that the Open Space Institute is, in, is interested in. Uh, there are some large properties in Mawarsing that may have an opportunity uh, for housing units or for open space purposes, uh, particularly down in the Spring Glen area. Uh, staff is flagging these uh, right now with the Office of Finance uh, as, as a potential for, for county uses. But if the municipal government feels that they're locally important, they should let us know. Anything I'm leaving out, Bert or Rob? No. Okay. All right. So, I mean, we are busy um, and I, um, and we continue to work on uh, transportation issues as well. So just be aware of the fact that we're, we also have three or four different studies ongoing with respect to transportation right now. I won't, I won't get into them, but we are involved in that. <coughs> Actually, okay. Kind of discussion, okay. Mike, can I move on to that? Yep, yeah, you can move on to it. Thank you so much. Um, so we have a capital program 
uh, discussion, we're required, not required, but we should file a report on the capital program um, for 2021 to, through 2026. I received no comments from the board. Did I miss a comment? Did somebody send me a comment that I missed? Okay. Um, I would like to file, file comments with the legislature and with the, and with the uh, county executive. Uh, and I would ask if the board would consider allowing the executive committee to review comments prepared by staff and then send those to the, uh, to the, uh, send those to the, um, to the legislature as a, as a comment. I'll make, I'll make that motion. And I'll second it. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Will we get to see them before they go to the exec? We would we would run them through the executive committee rather than back to the board because I mean I would certainly send them to the board, but other other than that I'm I'm going to have an ex if not I, I probably won't make the time frame by our next meeting. Okay. That's why I want the executive committee involved rather than submitting them just as staff comments. Okay. Dennis, Dennis you did mention uh, before at our other meetings that you did, there is one, was there one part that uh, you did, uh, there is up funding and for planning uh, for purchasing of pr property or something in this new budget, there was some added funding. Yes, there is a, there is a change to the, something called the shovel ready program uh, has been amended to that essentially be redefined as a community development program. Um, and we're having discussions with the legislature about that program in the budget, right in the capital program, excuse me, uh, right now in terms of how it's gonna roll out and what it will do. Um, there's a bit of nervousness with respect to that program. The legislature may not recommend that be funded in 2021 due to um, uh, issues with respect to uh, concerns as it relates to overall budget items. Uh, the legislature is taking a strong interest in the capital program this year, going through the program items one by one, and with particular attention to those that are recommended for funding in 2021. All right, because uh, I was just looking at the point where we we for the last few years we basically looking at land use issues and it we pretty much stayed pretty much common and, and that all all the all the remarks that you've uh, developed or you've addressed us on up to now has been in that way of where we've been as a board been wanting to go anyway so i'll try not to run a feel a far of that with the, with the executive committee okay Okay, so we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those opposed? Me, McLaughlin. Thank you. So noted. Any abstentions? Okay. Does that finish up on um, the capital program, Dennis? For me, yes. Okay. Rob, public comment? Do we have any? Uh, well, in attendance, we have an applicant for one project, so I'll promote him in a bit. But I see we have one person who called in. I don't know if they're... So if you have any public comment, raise your hand now. <laughs> Guess not. Okay. Well, then we'll um, move along to uh, zoning referrals. Uh, can I have a quick question? Did we jump over a special topics discussion or something? We just had that, Vince. All right, I had a quick question for Dennis in regards to um, does he have anything to report on uh, to do with the uh, roundabout project there in Kingston? Um, not really, Vince. I haven't seen an update on it um, in this month. Um, I mean, no, the short answer is no. I saw the latest on it was they were moving to uh, phase three this week overnight. Doing <clears throat> yeah, they, they just changed where where the where the, the lights are and what and what streets streets are open to get into it. 
Yeah. Um, that's what they're doing. And that's yeah. going to land last till late April, I think. Phase three is the actual roundabout? No, next no, phase after that. Get a ways to go. So yeah, just basically there. don't drive through there if you don't have to. It's not too bad. <laughs> <laughs> that sums it up. Thanks. Okay. Hey, let's go on to the zoning referrals, uh, All right, Rob. I'm yeah, I'm going to pr promote um, Adam Friedman, who is the um, applicant for Wildwick, and it's in Sorgerty. So if you want to jump on your agenda to that, he's going to give us a presentation. And okay. I'm going to let him uh, share the screen, his screen, too. All right. Hey. Thank you, Rob. No problem. I'm going to make you a co-host. There you go. Okay, fantastic. I will share them my uh my screen in a minute i just wanted to give uh the board an an update on our project and thank you all for taking the time i'll, I'll try and go as quickly as possible um we had previously gained approvals in the town of saugerties for a 72 key uh hotel on 84 acres uh on the hudson river and after we gained those approvals we we um, decided to go back and amend them, um, as intelligent as that may be. Um, and basically our goal in, in amending the plan was to create percent coverage, um, create less impact for the neighbors, you know, and spending time speaking with them. We realized that was um, a, a significant concern and then, and really just develop the plans uh, more fully, almost to the point of construction drawings, which is, which is where we're at now. And I will share my screen and I'm, I'm first gonna bring up, um, bring up our, ah, uh, sorry, one sec. I've gotta, gotta grant security permission first, <laughs> but I'll bring up our landscape plan, which will give you, a a good idea of uh, if you need me to i have a lot of it in our powerpoint already yeah and and i may i may show that to you and i apologize for not having a powerpoint together let me just try if i can do this now now i can sorry um okay um, and I apologize, the landscape set are large files, so occasionally it will take a minute for them to load. Um, and I'll actually pull up a image of our old site plan before and just walk through that really briefly, um, hopefully so you can get, get an idea of what that looked like. This was our, our previous site plan, and this is Route 32, if you see where my cursor is moving up here, and this is Liberty Street, where the main entrance to the hotel was. You would drive in, come through here, there'd be parking here, as well as overflow parking over there. Th these three buildings right here were what we call in rooms, which were rooms close to the main building, which was here. There was a restaurant here, a spa here, a gallery, meeting space, a number of buildings, a barn, um, some more meeting space back here, artist residences um, and, art, and, and uh, staff residences on the site. And so we wanted to, we wanted to try and do our best uh, to eliminate our uh, traffic impact. Excuse me one second, sorry. Um, and so we, we got rid of, um, we got rid of the artist residences on the site as well as um, the staff residences on the site. We felt mm -hmm. strongly that it's better to have the staff living in the community rather than, than living on site. You know, we're, we're really trying, trying to be the best neighbors we can. And so how we adjusted the plan is we essentially brought the main building and spa into the center square here, uh, put rooms on either side of it, an event space here and a little, a smaller greenhouse here. Um, this yellow area is all agroforestry farming land, um, 
with with a, a lawn clearing up here, which which was just required. Uh, I forget. Oh, because there's a wellhead there, and we didn't want to put uh, farm crops close to the wellhead, even though we won't be using it. Neighbors were concerned about you know any type of treatment, uh, although it'll be organic, getting getting into the water in the ground there. So we eliminated that. Essentially, just just really condensed the structures themselves. We kept our 24 one bedroom cabins and our 12 two bedroom cabins, um, which are year round facilities, uh, relatively in the same place that they were before. Um, some, you guys had given us some comments about chip and seal um, roads. We, we extended our chip and seal all the way to our loading dock as well as at the front entrance of the property, covering the handicap spaces and the loading area of the property, as well as the main entrance road and the service road off of 32. Um, and let me, I'm just looking at other comments. Um, you guys had asked us about the Western landscaping buffer plan I'll, to, to develop that more. We've now fully developed that um, with, with you know, what I would call excellent reception from, from the neighbors. Um, you asked us to develop our lighting plan a little further. We've done that and I can show that to you tonight if you'd like to see it. Um, but all in all, we did not increase the square footage of the project. We reduced the impact area on, on the property itself. Uh, we lowered the tallest building on the project by over 10 feet um, from grade and just just really, we hired an architect who's who's um, very very specializes in in just you know having buildings fit with the existing landscape, um, and you know he's done an, an excellent job, although although difficult to keep him uh, you know commercially viable. Um, but to the extent you guys would like to see um, lighting or landscape or or building plans, I'd, I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have them. Right. Um, two other comments we made last time, I believe on the Eastern portion of the site, we talked about um, conservation easement or keeping some of the existing trees in, in place and also mentioned about public access down to the waterfront were the other two comments I believe we made. Yes, so on, on the conservation easement, um, we, we had discussed that and we actually used to own the land, some of the land that these ball fields were on and ended up giving that to, to the town of Saugerties. We didn't, we didn't necessarily, as, as an applicant, have, have an opposition to the conservation easements, easement along the waterfront. Um, I, I'll state, you know, I, I don't think it was all that well received by the planning board. You know, certainly if there was a, a you know, walking path or something there uh, that made sense, we'd be happy to have it. Um, but, but frankly, it's, it's all private land south of us. And north of us is, is Glasgow Mini Park, which used to be part of this Northeast Solite site and was given to, to uh, the town, you know, years ago. To, to be the mini park. Matter of fact, we still have an easement through the, through the Glasgow mini park. And, you know, I don't think we'd reject it out of hand, but, but didn't feel, frankly, the easement would only be across our property, uh, from the park across our property. And for the use of our property, um, you know, it's not ideal. If, if it could continue on past our property, we'd certainly be interested in that. As far as uh, having access to the public to the waterfront, there's, there's a hypothetical access to the public on the waterfront in the sense that the project's entirely open to the public. Um, you know, we're not, anyone can come there, use our facilities as they see fit. Um, we don't really have a, a great way. We're not, we're not providing, um, we're not providing uh, any roads down to the waterfront and, and a specific goal of our project was, was to develop, you know, a significant distance from the waterfront. We didn't want to impact the waterfront at all. And, and we don't really see a viable way to get the public down there. It's, it's actually a significant distance to, to hike down to the waterfront from where the main building is back up. I've done it myself, I don't know, 50 times. It's probably about an hour and a half hike. Um, it's also a significant grade. So we do have this walking path, which, which will be accessible 
um, to the public, but not in the sense that, you know, anyone could come there or, you know, in, in the past, it's it's been used for hunting activities and things like that, even though it's been private land, uh, simply isn't viable commercially to have, have a hotel on the site and, you know, allow those activities to continue. And, and I'd note, you know, with the Glasgow Water Park, the public has access to the waterfront within, you know, uh, maybe a hundred yards of our site with parking and a boat ramp and docks. It's, you know, a significantly better experience for them. So Rob, if I, if I can, I'm sorry if I'm, if I'm muted. A couple things. One would be is, is that let's, I don't think we should confuse the conservation easement with the act with act with public access. Um, the conservation easement that the board was talking about was one on the lands that are beyond the bluff uh, as it moves down to the water, as it, as it moves down to the waterfront. The idea is to keep the cover on those lands and to keep the, um, and to keep those lands in, in, in forest. Um, there's a couple reasons for that. One would be is to make sure that, that the development is contained at, at the, you know, at, at the bluff level. The other thing to think about from the applicant standpoint, a conservation easement on those on those properties would likely help your tax situation. Um, that's why it was it was thought about. It, it's not uncommon to put conservation easements on on these types of waterfront lands. Um, I'll leave, just just say that that's what the conservation easement discussion was. The the access easement was more of, you know, the idea of trying to get an access along the waterfront. Um, on the Hudson River uh, across all the waterfront is something that the board has encouraged communities to do. Um, and I can understand, I can understand that the reluctance to do that and, and, and appreciate the reluctance to do that. Um, but if, if there was access to the adjoining properties and you could create a longer path rather than just access to your property and back and that path was managed in some way, shape, or form, maybe what the maybe what the board asks or should ask is is that we're not asking for we're, we're asking to enable an access easement sometime in the future um, with appropriate um, with with an appropriate responsibility being shared by a land trust or some or someone like Scenic Hudson or something like that, where effectively it becomes a longer path along the waterfront, not just an in and out uh, from the uh, from the, the current access that's there. And I visited that access and you're right, it's a really nice access that the town has at that location. Yeah, I, I you know, again, I think that's, that's probably a suggestion and that's something we spoke about in the meeting when this came up. Um, you know, we were, we were all for public access. We'd be very nervous to grant an easement, a public access easement there that ended at our property. It just, yep. It, I get it doesn't it. seem like a great idea. I, I will mention, you know, I've been involved on, on this site for five years. This is not something we're looking to, to build and flip. We're, you know, we're really planning to be there for a long time. So if, if that's something that could happen, we'd certainly like it. We're obviously a little nervous of having a public access easement that's, that abuts a park um, because people will use it and, and likely wouldn't be taken care of by anyone at this point, um, but but the idea of having public access along, you know, a significant portion of the Hudson River, we think is a fantastic idea. We'd, we'd like it not only for, you know, for the community, but also for our guests, it would be fantastic. Yeah, okay, all right. Can, can I ask a question? Um, I know Rob's, Rob has this in his presentation with respect to the project, which shows the areas of that you're going to sort of hardscape in terms of the road. Um, in the areas that you aren't, and, and my question is, is that that one is, that is which which are you defining as the service road? There you go. There it is. Yep. Sorry about that. I should have should have scrolled down there. So, um, yeah, just quickly tell you the the dark gray or black on the plan is chip and seal. The the blue bluish green on this plan is um, is. I'm gonna mess it up. Um, is not granite dust, but but that's essentially what it is. It's a hard packed surface. It, it's it's certainly not an asphalt road. Um, it's also more porous for drainage. You know, it will be rated for all emergency vehicle access. Certainly, a delivery truck 
could drive on it if they needed to. Um, you know, this is something, frankly, we fought long and hard at, at the local level about as well. Um, you know, we really didn't feel that that sort of the ethos of this project uh, that we're trying to develop lent itself to having either asphalt or chip and seal uh, the entire way around the site. You know, I'd, I'd also point out the the gray sort of right at the main entrance. We we put it there as well, uh, even though though the um, the other the other material is handicap accessible. You know, I think within reason you're going to have suitcases there. You're going to have wheelchairs, any other sort of devices there. You know, we felt we felt that was a, a reasonable idea. I, I actually think it, it was our, our suggestion at some point. Um, and, and certainly where we have delivery trucks driving every day, I, I would mention there's a hammerhead turnaround here um, that also fits a fire truck, although it doesn't look at it, look like it on this scale, it certainly does um, to, to a blow grade delivery dock. So they would come back out and then exit right on 32 as well. So, I mean, and I thank you for that, but the question is, is that access road that runs along behind the ball field, it, it seems to me somewhat counterintuitive to uh, the, the one that's in, the one that's going to hard, be hardscape that runs back up to 32. Um, it seems to me that, that why you would want to hardscape that and not hardscape the road through the parking lot seems to be a bit counterintuitive. <laughs> Frankly, I would not like to hardscape that, uh, but we agreed to it simply because we ran into a lot of concerns of dust from the neighbors. Um, and I, I would mention at this point on what I'll call the loop road, uh, there is a gate there. And yeah. so there is actually public access. Uh, it's simply for, we'll, we'll be using like Polaris style, um, uh, a, you know, U, UTE, UTVs, um, to get around the site and that's really what that's for. Um, you know, I, I, I read what, what had been written about maintenance as well as, you know, just about access, keeping it clear. Um, that's something that to us is integral. We, we can't operate half the property. And, and frankly, this is, you know, a relatively high end facility that, that we plan to, to maintain in house. You know, we won't be using a third party vendor to do it. Um, and, and all that equipment will be, will actually be stored right here, uh, by our utility shed. Um, so, so we do understand the concern there. We, we really fought long and hard for that and have, you know, a, a host of reasons, mostly impacting the view, you know, the part, part of this is, you know, we adjusted this entrance angle here so that when you're exiting the property, the only thing you're going to see is the cat skills. When you enter the property, you know, we move, we spread the cabins out so that you could see straight through to the river and really i mean you know that's the magic of this site i, I was actually on it today uh, also in glasgow mini park today and you know it's just it's so stunning especially this time of year but but you know all other times and and i i really couldn't forgive myself if i if i paved a road right right in the middle of that view no, we don't want you to pave that road. It's it's the parking lot we're concerned about more than oh, anything so, else. So in the parking, and we've also really adjusted the parking. Um, you know, again, we did with with your suggestion that you had previously given, we did add this area on yeah. for, for the handicapped spaces and the entrance, but but really are trying to keep a natural feel. And let me see if I can now show you. Uh, I am on the Oh, it might be on the lighting plan. Excuse me. The uh, oh, that was the landscape set. Uh, what the new parking will look like. Um, so before we had a parking lot with a center lane, um, and now we have created. Yeah, you know, last page, of course, and it will take a minute to load on my screen. I apologize. Um, we've created. It's it's this bottom image here. Uh, one driving lane with non fruiting. Uh, we're, we're presuming apple trees, but non-fruiting apple trees on berms between the parking lots and and the uh, drive-in lane. And I'd also mentioned that the parking's planned to be valet at this property. So it's not like you'll have, you know, a hundred guests a day walking back and forth through the parking lot. Part of the, the goal is certainly we're going to have people going off site to restaurants and things like that, but they'll be calling from their cabin 
having their car brought to the front of the property in the paved area, entering it there and leaving. Um, you know, and and again, we we feel we feel strongly that that the road type is is going to be sufficient. It it is ADA accessible. You know, it's it's not like we're doing a gravel road. It's it's a complete hard pack. Uh, like the surface of a bocce court is probably the best way to describe it. You know, you can you can actually roll a ball on it. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Alan. Thank you guys very much. And of course, if if uh, you guys have any more questions or any comments. Uh, Rob has my email. Feel free to reach out. You know, it's been a, a long time coming on this project, and we're we're really fo looking forward to getting it uh, underway and and having it open, which which we think will be, you know, not too long, about two years from now. Okay. All right. Can, can I ask one question? Now that he's taking it down. <laughs> it's I have it right here. What do you need? Uh, I just I saw, I saw the uh, reference to permeable uh, pavement, and I just was wondering where that was going to be. So the permeable pavement is, um, let's see. Yep, this is the best screen to show it. Um, we needed to have enough width on on this road for emergency vehicles to get by. And if you see this green area, I'm not sure if we can zoom in at the lower, by the, by the cabins, there's both blue and green on the loop road. So you see the green area. Yeah, and just, just in the very center, the entire loop road is permeable pavement. That's just directly over the, the corridor, the view corridor. And then the remainder of it is, initially our road was half as wide and the fire department wanted to be able to park a fire truck as well as have another one pass by or an, a, an ambulance or emergency vehicle pass by. And, and frankly, we deemed this was the best way to do it because of course it is right at the entrance to, you know, almost uh, two thirds of our cabins, but the road itself that people will be driving on uh, will, will still be the uh, crushed granite. Thank you. I have a question, Adam. Yes. Um, what are you doing uh, with regard to like um, energy sustainability and uh, renewable energy and you know structurally for the envelope as well as for your energy systems? Um, so, so structurally for for the envelope, we're going to to a, a pretty high rated insulation, although it hasn't been set what its R value will be yet, uh, but we're working on that. So. One thing I would mention is we'd really like to make the project as efficient as possible. Uh, we changed from propane heat uh, to natural gas, and, and we're, we're working on getting that all set right now. Um, you know, this isn't going to be a, a, a lead, lead built structure, uh, but we'd really, we, we were initially hoping to go electric heat. Uh, with solar on on every structure and at least be able to uh, to power the cabins that way, uh, but got I think there's a there's a history on this site that it was previously being considered as a solar farm, and there was significant uh, community pushback against it, and and so it's not it's not something that they're currently willing to let us do. I will mention that all the electric systems we are installing, we're going to be putting in solar hookups. Uh, so that if it's something we are allowed to do in the future, uh, we'll we'll be going that route. But but right now, uh, it's it's not something it, something we'd like to consider. And unfortunately, it's not something that's going to get approved. And have you looked at air or ground uh, or water source heat pumps or geothermal? We, we looked at geothermal extensively uh, and found it relatively difficult. We looked at both vertical and horizontal geothermal, and um, I I. Hope I'm not amiss when I say this. It's it's been a couple months and a lot of iterations, um, but it was it had something to do with the the soil type here and the amount of loop that we'd have to run. Um, Activity. Yeah, that it it was like it it was a mind blowing number higher. It it wasn't commercially feasible. I think it was almost 10x 
uh, the system we're currently doing, um, which which again was one of the one of the first things we looked at because it'd be fantastic for for this site. But but solar is certainly something our roof design leads leads itself to solar uh, that we'd really like to consider. But but for now, you know that's not the way the project's gonna gonna be constructed. Thank you. Thank you. What was the community's uh, objection to having solar on the site just for the uh, power of the buildings? Were they uh, objecting to the appearance or is there another issue? I believe it's the appearance um, as well as I know some comments were brought up on, on you know, the environmental impacts if, if solar panels are to break and and you know what the cleanup plan would be, and we we explained to them, you know, we're not we're not a commercial solar farm. Uh, you know, it would, be, it would be very similar to putting this on a the roof of a commercial building, something like that. But but in reality, what it came down to was appearance. Um, you know, our our roof lines are extremely low. I think grade of the main building is 156 feet, and the and and that's the grade on the upper upper image right there, the west elevation. And I think our roof line is 172 feet, uh, the, the highest point of our roof, so 18 feet above grade. Not to mention we're, you know, 700 feet, I think, from the nearest residence, if not more than that. Um, so I, I don't know, not to mention our screening, um, I don't know how much of a visual impact it would have. I think, you know, a lot of that is, is this is a big change for the area. Um, and I think they want to see how we do and what type of neighbors we are before before we really we think we think it will be viable at some point which is why we're going to put in uh the the boxes for it on on each structure but at this point we didn't really uh get anywhere with it for that matter so they would rather have uh exhaust from uh natural gas combustion <laughs> i'm really surprised well, you know, that, again, one of the considerations was whether or not we'd have enough solar to power the electric heat. Um, so back then, I think we were considering having propane backup, which would be, you know, similar, similar to, to the natural gas combustion. Um, but, but it's definitely something that's, that's under consideration uh, for us in the future. We'd, we'd like to make the property as environmentally friendly as possible, you know, part of the reason that we're building it at such a low density is is to experience the the natural land that's there. It's it's just it's a it's a stunning piece of property, and you know bringing people there is is very exciting to me. I had a guy walk it for the first time with me today, um, and you know just couldn't get over how beautiful it is. So, uh, you know, we're really looking forward to that. And I will mention as we look at this east elevation, you know, all of this is coated non-reflective glass. Um, because it will be facing the Hudson River. Um, and I won't pretend to know the specs of that, but, but apparently well within what it needs to be. Okay. Rob? All right, well, first thank of all- Thank you very much, Alan. I appreciate <laughs> thank it. You yeah, thank you, guys. Thank you. First, yeah, no problem. Uh, first, staff comments are basically a compliment. We like this version of the property. The proposal moves it further away from the residence, and it's a smaller, shorter building that, as you say, rolls with the land. It uh, it adjusts the contours of the land, so it fits more into the landscape. So we like we like that change at the staff level. That's another view of it. And so our comments, we had had some comments about the road materials. I don't know if we're still going to make those comments, Dennis, or not. I think we should make the comment about road materials, basically to make sure that they're plowable. That's the main thing. Other okay. than that, I don't. Other than that, I, I won't. I wouldn't basically say they have to hardscape it, but I think that we should make the comment that they're plowable. Right. Yeah. So we're going to continue to make the uh, the buffer the, along the bluff, the conservation easement on the bluff. We're going to make that comment. Um, the typical cabin details isn't an issue. We'll just we're going to take that. Oh, off improved site plan. That was the compliment I just paid. <laughs> and I 
how do you want to we when we'll make the uh, public <laughs> access comment that i think that dennis made earlier where we it's an advisory talk. comment that basically yeah. suggests to the town that you're sort of enabling access along the river in the future uh, in cooperation with the applicant and the and the fact that somebody has to take responsibility for maintaining that access and it's not the applicant's responsibility right um, but it's a long-term project do, the, do, the, do, the, do those kinds of things and and trying to enable it enable it now would be helpful i think and that's all motion to but i mean the main thing is is to, to comment on the fact that this this site plan is is significantly approved uh, and i quite frankly think it's improved for the, the people that are going to visit as well um, because the cabins now have some they were they were clustered before and i know that you don't like to spread things out but from a privacy standpoint particularly if you're vacationing that those that that kind of spread helps helps out and it's some of sometimes it's a design solution that some of the hotel management really really want rather than a clustered version where everybody can see everybody else okay so just before anybody makes some account there's a subdivision that is technically i think a uh, portion of the property down by the waterfront is actually in the floodplain so that's why it gets referred so we can make it all but that the subdivision itself is no county impact the rest are the required mods and the advisory comments so we take the special per permit and the site plan conier will make a motion to accept the have, it, have any recusals by the way yes lavity thank you i thought so yeah i mean or previously made the motion i second it welton Okay, we have a motion and a second on the site plan and the special permit. Any further discussion? All those opposed? Motion carried. <clears throat> Can I have a... Uh, Baden, Baden will make the motion on the subdivision, no county impact. Second, Scott McCarthy. Thank you, Scott. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those opposed? All right, motion carried. Thank you very much. Let's move on to. We're going to go <laughs> back to the top. Have a good night. Top of the agenda. Yep. All right, let me move back there. Going there to slow way, Rob? Yeah. <laughs> November 4th. There we okay. go. All right. So before we get into it, Town of Soap has sent us a whole package of local laws, number five through number 13. I split them up into several different referrals, but a bunch of them are connected. So we might want to take them one at a time. We'll, we'll, we'll do it that way. But some of them are explained at the same time. I'll tell you when to, let's see, five, six, and, <laughs> sorry, five, six, and seven can be handled together. So the first, so I'll discuss them in that context for that. So a lot of the definitions we see are respect to, we have definitions in local law number five. This is all centering around this uh, junkyard uh, definition and what the town is actually doing, and you'll move when we get to local law number seven, they're going to be, which is two referrals from now, they're repealing the chapter, which is another special authorization to repealing that from the town code entirely. There's another definition, another law in local law after this, where they're making junkyards a prohibited use. So what they're doing in local law five, the first one we're seeing is they're defining several different items, including junkyards, and then they're going to prohibit it. And one of the big catch-alls in junkyards is that there's a strong focus on not just junkyard operations, but any kind of situation where there's materials that are left outside that are, whether they be unregistered vehicles or operable vehicles, as you can see in the, uh, if you're reading the uh, definition here. 
there's so it can it can get really small scale where they're trying to clear blight and they can define it as as a, a junkyard. The other um, we'll see the warehousing, the warehouse and self storage uh, issues. Um, uh, not issues. Uh, uses later on. Those are no kind of impact. The farm operations deals directly with the junkyard as they are basically exempting certain unused vehicles or un unoperable vehicles that as long as they're in um, state certified agricultural districts and exempting them from the prohibition on junkyards. So some issues with the junkyard definition is that there's not much differentiation between, okay, if you have a contractor's yard, contract yards usually have building supplies. Up here, it's, it mentions building supplies. So we, what we want them to do is an advisory comment is to distinguish the two between, distinguish the two different uses, make sure that other uses like contractor yards, things that use materials, landscape supply companies don't get lumped together, make dis clearly distinguish between the two, provide standards, maybe provide additional standards for contractor yards that require screening and things of that nature in order to not have the two types of uses intersect. Also, the, since the junkyard can apply to, if it's, if you leave materials outside your house, there, there should be a time frame component to it. And when they um, use, when they, uh, they should put that into the law to say, this is when it becomes it. So they should have a certain amount of time to remove those materials before. More than 30 days, more than 60 days, that kind yeah. of stuff. Yeah, okay. Right. So those are the advisory comments on number five. Rob, Mike Bay, now can, can you go back? I have one question on one of the definitions. Go for it. So the farm operation where they say land consisting of not less than seven acres, did they give any rationalization of where the seven acres came from? And, or are they saying that if you're less than seven acres, you're not a farm operation, you're just an agricultural use? Because it kind of seems to me a little arbitrary because with, with Bert can probably attest to this with some of these smaller sort of niche farming operations, we're seeing things come in less than seven acres, more, you know, uh, it's becoming more prevalent in, in smaller operations. Yes, right. so small plot like intensive farms, Mike, you're absolutely right. Right. And I, this, I think hey. the seven acres comes from uh, the tax code. You know, seven acres or less than you know. Right, 50, but that's just taxation. That has nothing to do with land use, and that's where a lot of people make that confusion. I I know, but I think that's probably where they pluck the number from. Yeah, I, I appreciate land that use. input. Yeah, but I think we should make a comment, advisory comment, Rob, that they should rethink that seven acres in light of that. That's a taxation designation not a land use designation and and it, it it seems somewhat arbitrary and small pot intensive farmers can can be more can be successful on a lot smaller than areas than seven acres absolutely right. yeah it, it does seem arbitrary from there's there's no explanation for the seven acres they just stay yeah in. yeah i think bert's probably correct but mm. it's 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 mixing apples and oranges okay we'll add that to the advisory comment I'm missing uh, the line after a private garden accessory. My computer is cutting it off. Is there more text? Private garden accessory. Yeah, the bottom line under farm. It, it operation. says to a residential use shall not be deemed a farm operation. <laughs> so if you have a home garden greater than seven acres, <laughs> they're not going to call it a farm operation. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Any other comments? I'll, I'll go ahead and make that motion, Rob. Okay. Okay, thanks, Mike. Is there a second? Second, McLaughlin. Thanks, you, Vince. Any further discussion? All those opposed? Okay. Local law number six. So local, uh, well, Roxanne's not here, so I don't think there are any recusals. Yeah. Right. Okay. So anyway, 
So this one is just the list of prohibited and restricted uses in the town and are specifically now adding junkyards as a prohibited use. And then exempt to the extent that junk and junk vehicles are used for farm operation for agricultural purposes. I don't know if you want to make any comment about why should it just be limited to agricultural district lines or not. But at this point, we don't, staff thinks there's no county impact at the moment. And we're getting into specifics. Okay. I'll make that motion, Mike Baden. Thank you, Mike. Mark, second. Thanks, Scott. Hey, Mike. Scott. Hey, Rob, it's Roxanne. I am on. So you can. Oh. Oh. oh, you snuck oh. in here, huh, Rox? But yeah, do you well, need to uh, recuse yourself from uh, zoning amendments? Uh, well, it's before our board for uh, review. Okay. Then you are. Yeah, they have to refer any local laws to, to, to planning. the planning board for, for yep. comment. All right. All right. So we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? I mean, all those opposed. Excuse me. I'm opposed. Who is that? A Geo is Geo. opposed. Okay. All right. All right. We'll move on to seven. Roxanne's uh, recused. Excused. So this is basically them just repealing the entire chapter with respect to regulating junkyards. No county impact on that. So moved, Mike Baden. Second. McLaughlin. Thanks, Vince. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those opposed? Okay. Local law right. number eight. All right. So, Roxanne's recused again. Yes. Okay, so we're moving away from junkyards now. And back to two of the other air things that were defined in local law number five, and those were warehouse warehousing and self-storage warehouses. So let me just give you an idea real quick where these things are. So warehouse and warehousing would be allowed by site plan review in the general commercial, light industrial, and heavy industrial districts. Self-storage would be special permit in the heavy industrial district. Let me just uh, switch my share here. If it'll let me. There we go. All right. A little chart ArcGIS online for you. So that's R12. So right now, so that would be GC district is here in red. Is where that would be allowed. And Huh. <clears throat> it's in that center district, right, Rob? Right. It's not all of it. Okay, sorry. I was I was I had used a different map earlier and it's okay, so L I is over in here, H I is over in here. Why is and we're not letting me annotate tonight for some reason. So oh, sorry. <clears throat> There's also H I over here in that area as well. So it doesn't make that much sense for self-storage uses to be allowed on a former Dino Bell, no Bell site. I mean, it, it doesn't make not sense there actually. And and to not allow it in the uh, general commercial, uh, just the essential comment, and let me move back to my, uh, let me move back to my PowerPoint here. The comment that I just wanted to make was warehousing, self-storage uses, those are not the highest and best uses for sites that have access to municipal water and sewer. So just want to make a comment that they should try to avoid locating them in those locations. Self-storage should be also, there's no reason that we can see that it shouldn't be allowed in the same districts as warehousing uses. But again, that these are not uses that are water or sewer intensive and 
they would be uh, mis- <laughs> <laughs> misplaced on yeah. sites that have that kind of um, higher and better use. <laughs> that would just be an advisory comment. Mike Bain, I'll make that motion. Drew, second. second. Thanks, Drew. Any further discussion? Uh, yeah, this is Drew. I, Rob, I, I'm curious about something. Really doesn't have anything to do with voting on it, but sure. Did they give a rationale as to why they they're creating so many local laws instead of bunching them all together? And well, second, how did they handle seeker? Uh, did, did they do one seeker form for all these changes, or did they do a one for each one? They did a seeker for each one, so I have a seeker for each one. But they send it to me as one referral with a bunch of local laws of a bunch of different seekers. So I then spread it out into different referral numbers. <laughs> okay. Drew, the only reason that rationale I can think of is they may have split it up to to focus the public comments on on specific items, and they probably treated each action independently. So. That's right. probably so. Okay. okay. Anything? Any further discussion? All those opposed. Okay, next one up. This Local. ten. This is number nine. Number nine. This is oh, a yeah. bus shelters. No county impact on that. Essentially, what they're doing is allowing the town board to issue licenses for bus shelters throughout the town. We don't have staff has no issue with allowing bus shelters. Motion. Scott McCarthy. Uh, motion. Scott I'll McCarthy. make the motion. Rob, did, throws on me. <laughs> Rob, did they put a criteria for the review in the code? It's a bus shelter. It's a bus shelter, but okay. I mean, you know, they have to be as designated well, by you, yeah, Pat. My only concern, Dennis, is it could become arbitrary and you might get areas where they're really needed and, and you know, Somebody right. doesn't want it. So that's the only reason I was asking if there was a rationale mm. behind the criteria so it could be documented. Right. That won't be an issue because they have to be designated by UCAT or, okay. or associated with multifamily senior housing or multi somewhere multi tent uses. Okay. And are subject to approval from town, county, state, whatever right away they're on. I just didn't want it to become popularity. That was my concern. No, no, and they're not allowed to have advertising on them either. So Okay. Okay. I have a motion from Scott McCarthy. Uh, I'll, I'll Mike. second it, Mike Baden. Okay. Any further discussion? All those opposed? Okay. Local law number 10. All right. Number 10. Now, this is the uh, the big change of the evening for the town of Sopus. Town of Sopus is proposing a mixed-use floating zone, which... <laughs> What does? <laughs> so what they're doing is they're going to allow this in the BC, the G district, which is Broadway and Portview and Hamlet area, and the general commercial district, which goes from River Road to Dick Williams Lane. It's a very small area, and I'll show you that in a little bit. They say central water and sewer here. Elsewhere, they say municipal water and sewer here. We're going to make an advisory comment, make sure they say municipal water and sewer, because those are two very different things. That will be an advisory comment. Uh, minimum lot size, 20,000. That is a typo there. It's 20, no, it's not. 20,000 square feet in the BC zone and one acre minimum in the general commercial. Mixed use is required. Two stories is required. No more than two separate buildings with a uh, minimum of one building being a mixed use building. So this is what essentially this law is, is smart growth on a very small scale. Because, and you'll see why. So. Oops, there we go. So on the left, you have the BC district in purple there, pink, fuchsia <laughs> there. So that would be that location. So pretty small area. And then on the red outlined in that light lime green, you have from River Road basically to the bottom of Bosey's over by where uh, Birch's is, this of Asopus is. So it's a pretty small area. And most of these parcels, as you'll see, have structures already on them. So what this law is about is the eventual retrofit or reuse of underutilized parcels and structures is what it really focuses on. 
And what I've highlighted here in red, this is the BC zone. The red ones would be parcels that actually meet that 20,000 square feet criteria in this case. That doesn't mean that they couldn't combine parcels if they so wanted to meet those thresholds. So it's not that many buildings and most of them have let uses already on them except for about one. And then you have the GC zone and the area So our first comment is, is, has to do with scope. And first is why not consider to the north, which is also still GC zone. So this is um, Spinnel Weber's over in here and have some single family homes. This is um, Medrex over in here. And that's the, well, that's the library over there. But these have long-term future potential for mixed use and more larger scale mixed use development that, that that as part of the town's gateway that they should consider so everything about this an infill project so why not expand it to really look at that and then also we talked about i don't think i have it here but down south as you go towards um the wooden wheel site and the uh the fencing company which is on across the road from that. Those are great sites that have unfulfilled potential as well. So for the long term, so we, we so one of our comments is they should really consider expanding the scope. So the other thing that we're comment is that the standard has they have a lot of standards in this. So you'll see base densities, you'll see maximum densities. So eight. And then there's a lot of density bonuses, but the maximum density you can get up to is 12 units per acre. So what we'd actually like the town to do is really rethink about the way they do this. They can use these as guidelines, but really consider having applicants look more at the context of each individual site and applying for it. And then really consider them guidelines, not necessarily standards and say, this is what we're trying to achieve. We really want pedestrian scrub. We really want parking in the rear. We want mixed use. We want affordable housing, things of this nature and work from that basis rather than already set people with standards that may limit their flexibility. So these are just some of those. You wanna to go to your recommendations, Rob? Sure, that's just the maximum. And just uh, the work fire, the uh, dwelling, that wasn't a mandate. That is just a bonus is what they have in here. Uh, and also a lot of mandatory design standards. And this was the pr just before I go to it, but this was the original process, which is a sketch plan per conference with the town board, then the sketch plan. Tam plan board sends a report back to the town board who would then approve the, or disapprove that MFC and then you go back through site plan approval. So that's the uh, process right now. And keep in mind, these are, as I showed you, these are pretty small sites for that large uh, detailed of a process. So our advisory comments focus on, on process. So they should use them as guidelines. And again, we can provide the, um, the uh, county's design manual as one way to look at things, but just that look at a design and look at context of the site to create more flexibility rather than outright have standards. Because you want to draw more interest by having preset standards, you might draw less interest to it. Um, there, are, as you can see, there was no images. You've here, they should really be, be uh, doing some, like in the town of Lloyd, when they did their waterfront overlay district or mixed use district, they provide, this is what we want to see. They should consider doing something similar that gives some ideas to potential applicants of what they would like to see on site. And again, that the Ulster County Design Manual would help out a lot with that or give some ideas for that. And then the other advisory comment had to do with the geographic extent that I mentioned earlier. Rob, do you know, do they define mixed use in their code, in their existing code? Because I don't see it. I just looked online at their draft of this and I don't see it defined. 
I don't believe so. That might, we may want to add that they define it so it has a, an actual definition and it should, even though it's an overlay zone, they, if they're allowing a use, they should define what that use really means. All right. So if, if I can, Rob, go for it. One, one of the reasons that we, we talk a little bit about process. Oops, sorry. One of the reasons we talk about process and, and, and standards has to do with the fact that it's a floating zone and it comes in front of the town board to be established. So if you have all of these standards in the zoning statute, the point being is, is the town board in establishing this you know, could give could give relief to any of those standards at any particular time on the basis of their of their establishing the floating zone. And the thought being is, is you want to encourage not just people to look at this and say it's worthwhile, but you want to encourage innovation in there as well. So setting them up at, at design guidelines and allowing them to submit what I would call innovative plans to the for consideration by the town board would not automatically exclude them because they don't meet some arbitrary standard that would, may have been set years ago um, in terms of when the zoning statute was, well, the, the amendment was passed. So we want to try to give, the reason for this is we want to try to basically say, when you're going through that site plan and sketch that sketch plan review process, here's what we want you to use. But if you have any, if you have a really unique way or a difficult site and you can't use those, then come to us with those concept plans and, and allow them to move forward. And the town board doesn't have its hands tied. Uh, and it gives, it gives them an, an opportunity, to, it gives the applicant and the town board to, to be much more responsive to the site and to things that they, they really like or really want to see have built without going through variance requirements or something else. And the town board can essentially go back and, and approve the sketch plan um, and, move it, and move it through on that basis without having to go through any of the other issues that are typically um, part of a zoning statute change without a town board, without town board involvement. I have a question. I'm a little confused on what it means to be a mixed use floating zone. Does that mean that it has to be mixed use in that zone or that it's just an additional option? That's, that's exactly that. The base zone remains, the zone floats over it and you can do the base, you can do what's in the base zoning which is a GC district here, or you can try to go through a, a floating zone, which is essentially having to come back to the town board and establish that and, and set that zone down on that particular piece of property. Okay, thank you. Okay. I have a motion for local law number 10. I'll make the motion, I'll put it. Second. Thanks, Frank. Thanks, Vivian. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those opposed? Okay. Let's move on to number 11. Okay. Number 11. Okay, and I'm sure Roxanne's recusing again. Is basically just putting the mixed-use flowing zone in the purpose section, and Quite frankly, this purpose section works whatever method you use. It still gets you where you need to be. That that purpose works. So no county impact on this. Mike Bay, I'll make that motion. Second. Second. Hey, second. Okay, motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those opposed? Okay. Number 12. Almost there. So I can do 12 and 13 together, essentially. This, then basically uh, 12 defines motor freight terminal. As you can see here, it's a building for receipt, transfer, short-term dispatching of goods transported by trucks. And then it's allowed in number 13 by special permit in the GC, LI, and HI zones no county impact on either 12 or 13. So much motion. Who made the motion? McLaughlin. Thanks, Vince. Second was? McCarthy, I'll do it. Thank you, Mr. McCarthy. <laughs> we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? 
All those opposed? Okay. All right. And we're out of Asopus. Out of Asopus. Okay. Town of Gardner, any recusals? Gardner's 110 Sheldon Road. A few months ago, we reviewed 115 Sheldon Road. It's for a single family home in the SB2 district. This has even less visual impact. Already has approvals from Ulster County Department of Health, by the way. They've already done their conservation analysis. It's a single family home. There's no county impact on that. So moved, Mike Baden. Second. Second and I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? That was for both, mm -hmm. right, Rob? Yes, please. Yep. yep. Thank you. All those opposed? Motion carried. Town of Oak Walls. Any recuse? No. So 175, 177, Rose Lane Clearing. Um, this, there's no kind of impact on it, but just to tell you what it is to avoid confusion is it's a property where you had an applicant, I mean, you had the owner ask a contractor to do some clearing for him so he could put a trailer on his site. It turned out that that contractor did a lot more clearing than he requested. So now he and the town are going about fixing that by planting a hundred two to three gallon trees on site, mixing the species, leaving limbs in place and doing everything they can to uh, repair the site. So there's no county impact on it. It's a good thoughtful process on uh, fixing up that site. And this um, square over in here, this, this is the location where they're, they're basically planting all, planting that whole area with new trees. McCarthy motion. Second, Lisa. Early. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further <clears throat> discussion? All those opposed? Okay. Next one up, Homeland Towers. So, okay. Homeland Towers. Ooh, let me clear my annotations here. So, we reviewed this for the use variance a couple months back. And we made an advisory comment about screening. It has now been posdeck by the town. We only just received the draft scoping, which means the town will be requesting a lot more information than we currently have, even though it's before us for special permit site plan. So I could go into more detail tonight, but the upshot is we're going to, staff is going to rec recommend this be re referred once that scoping is complete, whether they have to go forth and produce a EIS or not. <laughs> so that's so that, the, that'll be a required modification, Rob. That will be a required modification because this is far from a complete application. So move, Mike Baden. Second, Drew. Thank you, Drew. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion on this? Okay. All those opposed? Okay. All right, so now we can skip Wildwick. Yep. And go to our last one in the evening. Okay. So this is off of. Oh, you need a first, recusal on this one. Right? Recusals. I missed Lavity, probably. So this is off of King's Highway. Let me just share my screen a little bit. We reviewed something close by this location just a few months back. So, so we reviewed this site a few months ago where they put their uh, new building out here. So this is right here, proposed dog training, agility, things of that nature going on. No overnight stays, industrial area. There are no neighbors except for the highway. 
Um, it's a pole, 12,000 square foot pole barn and then a 4,000, almost 5,000 square foot uh, office and more train indoor training area. They are going to have events. Um, there's more details that are coming back from us. I believe the town sent their SWIP is still being prepared. More materials, I believe, may have been received today. There were some requests for, since they're having special events, for a closer look at parking demand based on those events. Um, so I'll, let me uh, go back to my comments. So this is the site, and that's... Holy Christmas. But this is all gravel lot on the site. Don't have the lighting details. I mean, all events will end at 7 p.m. Um, let's see. We don't have a landscaping plan for it. But again, it's a use that's not near anything or any residential neighbors. So just our comments are a re-refer once they're since they're still getting information on it. Just want to have a look at event traffic and parking. The gravel parking lot has no markings for their spots. So they, they're saying 55 spots, but we'd like to see how that relates to the demand of any of these potential events and that they should, the ADA parking spaces, they show three, but they don't show differences in the pavement treatment. Lane details should be provided, landscaping plan and SWIP drainage, drainage and uh, erosion sediment control need to be provided. Okay. I'll yeah. move it. Second, Thanks, Mike. Baden. Thank you, Mike. Any further discussion on this one? Who seconded? By the way, Baden. Oh, Thank you. you. Mike. Mike did. Who yeah. seconded then? Uh, Baden. Then who moved it? McLaughlin. I did. Oh, thank you, babe. I didn't. I didn't hear Vince. I'm sorry, Vince. <laughs> Robert, it's Lisa. Sure. Um, I, I I attended a lot of large dog training competitions. Um, they're going to address that further. It looks like they have more work to do. Yeah, that was the question that they had with respect to those special events. Yeah. Yeah. I I mean, I went to Bayshore. I've been. We used to do them at the Armory. Um, vets on call, emergency vehicles. Um, I'm curious. Yeah, they yeah. did have some parking for trailers, which I believe over in here. If they do it a lot, I mean, they're huge events, AKC match shows and um, trials are huge. <clears throat> um, I don't know if that's a valid concern. We could ask that question. Yeah, I mean, we don't know anything about the events, so no, we can just. And they ask the stopped. Question. They shut down the armory when I was there years ago after nine eleven. So, I get it. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Lise. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those opposed. I'll oppose. Okay, Lisa, thank you. Okay, anything else before this August boy body tonight? That's all. I Motion thank you adjourn. all. So we're gonna be doing this again next month. Yes, uh, we'll be doing this again next month. Do we have the party before or after? Yeah, I'm going to bring, <laughs> uh, we're going to do a virtual ham next month. <laughs> yeah, darling. Don't try to eat chips unmuted, though. Unmuted. <laughs> <laughs>